So Doug already started talking about seismic imaging and subduction zones. We're going to have a few more seismology talks. Mine's mostly going to be focused on structural imaging. Um, but a, a little bit at the end, I'm going to take a look at seismicity near volcanoes because I didn't know if that would show up anywhere else in the seismology talks. Um, but the megathrust seismicity I'll leave alone, and I'm sure um, Susan will give a great talk on that. Um, so we're going to look at things ranging from um, sort of the, what I'll call large scale, not whole mantle, but basically upper mantle and transition zone kind of scale slab morphology and how tomography works. Um, zoom in a little bit more to the wedge setting um, and the sharp interfaces that might be there, looking at those with teleseismic data, a little bit with active source data, and then zooming right into the magmatic system at Mount St. Helens and just a few short stories about um, the kinds of things we can see at the end. So those are the topics that I just described to you. I would say my goals are um, maybe a little simpler than the topics. And the goals would be um, to sort of increase some, some useful awareness of common seismology methods. So targeting people who would want to um, understand those methods but are not seismologists. Um, and have some idea of the fundamental aspects of each tool so that you could maybe critically assess some seismology results or at least ask some good questions if seismology is not your thing, but you care about those results for your field. And I'll try and um, use those fundamental aspects to kind of describe where I think we're limited by methods and where we're limited by our observations. And um, with each of these topics above, I'll try and just raise some outstanding questions for, um, for those topics. The other thing I want to bring up before I get farther into this is that there's also um, a seismic tutorial that I'll lead this afternoon. And um, it's going to be on fairly simple um, body wave tomography of subduction zones. And we're going to use synthetic data. So one, there's a real answer, and I know it. Um, and but, but you, you won't until the end. That's um, part of the deal. So we'll, we'll try this with local slab sources. So this is sort of an example um, from, from Central America of using just local earthquakes to image. And you get a lot of detail in this um, sort of smaller scale setting right near the wedge. You could also try and image subduction zones with only teleseismic data. And this is an example from um, the, the Central Andes. Or you could try and combine those two. Um, types of data and see um, if you could get sort of a continuous view from the higher resolution up here to the larger scale structure of the slab. So we'll, we'll, we'll play with all of that and at the end or near the end we'll look at what the actual structure is after you try and interpret the results from each of the three flavors and um, we'll try and talk about why some aspects of it worked very well and some others might not have worked as well. Okay. So just to start, um, I want to talk about some different approaches to seismic tomography. So it's maybe a little bit less black box to people. But we typically approach this as just a linear inverse problem that we'll solve iteratively. So we might have data, which in our simple case would be travel times. We'll often call some, uh, well, our goal is to get this model vector m, which is just the velocity at all these different points we could come up with. So we could come up with a really simple model where we have this sort of tic-tac-toe board. And so we'd have nine entries in M, just those nine squares. And then what G is, is just a way to relate our data to the model vector. So say, how, um, how are we going to map travel time onto the velocities here? This is straightforward because it's just distance equals rate times time. And I have these straight line rate paths. So that simplifies things. Actual rate paths are more complicated. Um, but here, we're just looking at it as this matrix G would just be a proportion of the length of the ray path in each square. So if we were to take really simple data, this is essentially all that's in a ray theoretical tomography code, aside from very careful bookkeeping, is that we could look at one ray path that runs across the top of the model. So it's going to hit M1, M2, M3. And so we could look at that ray path as having a time and I'll just for simplicity consider these to be unit width blocks and one unit per second um, velocities as a background model. So we could see this one comes in maybe a little slow, a little more than three seconds. 
but that top row of this G matrix would just be a 1 in each of 1, 2, and 3. And then it has no sensitivity to the rest of the model, so it doesn't tell us anything down here. It would be really nice if more often we had orthogonal ray paths like this. We usually do not, um, but this simplifies things here. If we looked at ray 2, then it would just hit model parameter 1, 4, and 7. So we'd have a 1 here, here, and here, and it wouldn't be sensitive to any of the other blocks. And so we could think about how do we fit this data. And in this case, I'm considering ray 2 to have a little smaller travel time, so it went a little faster. So if we tried to solve this kind of problem, what we'd end up with is both blocks or both times sampled this one, so it would probably stay near the, the background model, and then we'd get some smeared out lower velocities over here to explain why this took half a second longer than expected, and some fast velocities here to explain why this took a little um, less time than expected. And so the more paths we have crisscrossing this, the more we could say about each individual block. And this is something we could work out by hand if we just had nine blocks, um, but usually we have many more. So if we were to look at a teleseismic tomography problem, this is a good example of what those sensitivity values might look like for one ray path. So the darker color in here is stronger sensitivity. And so one ray path going to one station through the upper mantle would, um, would hit these blocks in the model space, and it would have no sensitivity to all these other blocks. So we'd need a lot of blocks at different angles to um, constrain this. And so this is sort of the simplest way, if we look at this with, with ray theory to make this matrix. But this formulation of the problem basically stays the same, even if we try and make it a little better or um, in, increase the uh, realism in the model. So one thing that um, was a um, significant advance, go back. Um, about well, almost 20 years ago now, um, was to start looking at what the actual sensitivity is rather than just the ray path. And so this is um, from, from work by um, Dolan and Hung. Um, but what we're looking at here is a turning ray in the mantle, and we're looking at it for a period of two seconds. This is the volume of Earth that it's sensitive to. And it basically just looks like this dark, um, sort of bent or warped ellipse here, and that's the volume it's sensitive to outside. There's no sensitivity. So it, for this short period, we could pretty much use our ray theoretical approach, and we'd be about right. If we look at longer period waves, especially if they're filtered in narrow bands, they start to get uh, a little more interesting shape, where there's actually less sensitivity along the ray path, positive sensitivity adjacent to it, and this would, would flip signs. So at this longer period, we're getting, we, we would want to account for these effects. Um, just using ray theory would be a lot weaker approximation. And these might not seem um, intuitive, why this shape, people sometimes call them uh, banana donuts, which is a little odd. You could maybe see the banana shape, the hole in the middle, where there's not much sensitivity would be the, the donut aspect. But where this comes into play is that we're not just looking at the ray path now, we're considering energy that's scattered off of it, so it might scatter at this point x. And if it arrives in time to interfere with that first arrival, then it's going to mess with our travel time measurement. So things that are arriving, all those different energy paths that could arrive near that first arrival are um, now being considered. The simplifying assumption still is that it's single scattering, so this doesn't get to bounce off, say, multiple x's. Um, before making it there. And so all this does for the problem we were looking at is that it's, I would say, something like a moderate increase in the, the accuracy of G, a little better way to relate our data to um, the model parameters. And things that we can do with it then are use multiple frequencies. If we're just assuming ray theory for G, there's no point in measuring body wave travel times in different frequencies, yet we record a broad range with modern instruments. So that's helpful. And that kind of reduces our need to um, sort of apply ad hoc um, smoothing constraints. So these are both things that have been around a while. Um, we hear about some different types of tomography a lot lately. And so I just want to mention kind of where this is going, or two different directions that are being pretty aggressively pursued. So one of them that people have been doing a lot lately and are, are pushing forward with is to retain pretty simple forward models 
1D based forward problems, but use modern computing power to really sample the, the highly um, multi-dimensional parameter space. So if we have a lot of parameters, maybe we don't just want the least squares optimal solution. We want to know are there a bunch of different things that could look right. Hopefully you recognize that a lot of the models we show you are, are non-unique. And so this is really trying to go after the non-uniqueness and uncertainty. The second approach is that we retain a simpler inversion. We just go downhill in the, in the misfit function until we get a least squares optimal solution. But we use modern computing power to go to a more accurate forward problem. Um, and so I'll just briefly describe both of those and then we'll move on to talking about how these, these methods are applied in subduction zones. Um, so one of these, I'm not going to talk about surface waves much, but Doug did um, for um, some Western Pacific subduction zones on, on Monday. But we could try a bunch of different models. So in this approach, we're just going to take our data D and we're going to have some forward model. And we're just going to try a lot of different M and see which ones fit and which ones don't. We'll do it a little more intelligently than just trying every possible M, but we have to try many. So in this case, Shen et al. tried something like 10 to the 5 models that, are, um, that could fit the data at this one point beneath the US array station. And then they can plot, say, um, uh, these corridors where the misfit is above some certain or below some certain level. So the red corridor is a certain chi-squared contour. And we could say anything in here fits at an acceptable level. The, perhaps the compromise is that this is a locally 1D dispersion curve, yet our surface waves are running across a model that looks like this and is not the same everywhere. So we're getting a handle on the accuracy, but we're not simulating the forward problem um, so realistically. And the way you'd make a 3D model out of these is to stitch together a bunch of 1D models beneath all of these points. So that's one way we could do it. Traditionally, or so far, there have been very few attempts to go this sort of guided searching route for body wave tomography because it's 3D. So there's tons of model parameters. Sometimes there's on the order of a million model parameters. So this is a, a cool new attempt from um, Burdick and Lechik. And in this case, the forward model is a ray tracing travel time calculation. And they're trying all sorts of different possible model parameters, actually changing the size of model parameters as well as the value of velocity in them to see what they, what's the minimum they need to fit their data. And so in this case, they've had to go to um, a high performance computing environment to be able to do travel time tomography. But they're starting to get an assessment of uncertainty. Um, so this is one direction that often people are trying to push now. And so it's, it's great to be able to get the um, constraints on uncertainty. But then the questions that we might still have are, how accurate is this f? The other way we can go is we can work, sorry, yep. Yes. OK, so if, um, yeah, the question was, what are these parameters? And the parameter, if we're doing um, velocity tomography, is the velocity in some discrete volume of Earth. And so in this little box, they're just trying to say, what's the seismic velocity? Millions. Oh, yes. Yeah, so there are a lot of different algorithms you can use to try and intelligently search. So you could say randomly spread out models to start with. And then you could start sampling the ones that are most successful nearby those initial models. Um, and there are a lot of different um, uh, uh, applied math algorithms to try and make that as efficient as possible to say that we'll sufficiently sample this huge space that we won't miss the best options but we won't spend too much time looking around in the areas that are definitely not going to fit our data. Um, but it ends up exploring lots of models that are terrible fits to the data and calculating usually on the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of models. So we get to see if there's any, um, we get some assessment of the non-uniqueness. Do we get 
for one model parameter like this orange stuff here, do we find out that actually if we looked at the fit to the data, we have a multimodal distribution that it could either be really slow and something next to it's a little different, or do we just get a nice kind of Gaussian distribution and we, we're not sure exactly the value, but we know um, there's a well-defined sort of optimal or well-defined mean. Go back. A little touchy. Okay, so the second route we could go is to use modern computing to really go after doing this G part right. Go after a, a, a much more realistic um, relationship between our data and our model parameters. So in this case, we would use, and this is from, from, from Tape et al. in 2010, we'd use um, elastic or, or slightly anelastic synthetic seismograms computed in 3D to calculate waveforms. Here the data vector is not actually the full waveform, it's still frequency dependent travel times, but they're measured off of waveforms computed using um, the full 3D computation. And so if we looked at a 1D reference model, these waveforms don't fit too well, and then after they do many iterations, the waveforms start fitting better. But the, the data in this case, what they're trying to optimize the fit to is still a frequency dependent travel time. What should be a little sobering is if we look at what these updated sensitivity kernels are. In my earlier representation, this would be a straight line between the receiver and the earthquake. Right? And in this case, the sensitivity values, stronger sensitivity in the, in the um, deep reds here, it's basically warping its way around these faults in Southern California so that it's basically guided by the 3D structure that already exists. And it looks quite a bit different than a 1D approximation, especially if we're concerned about something like fault structure in Southern California. Um, this was, I would say at the time, pioneering work and it's getting increasingly possible to do this at sort of larger subduction zone scales. But this is the route where we really go to uh, dramatically increase the accuracy here. Sometimes the practical compromise we have now is we have to go to longer wavelengths for our data. So if we were to look at this in a global context, we could image the Earth with one hertz travel times, or we could do waveform tomography with, say, greater than 20 second period data. So we might trade off 20 times longer wavelength for a much more accurate G. But as computers get faster, that trade-off gets more and more favorable. So um, the people who are most savvy with the computers wait that out. Um, and this is one example that I think is particularly interesting for subduction zones, going this full waveform inversion route. Here they are actually changing D, and they're using a, a normalized cross-correlation of the waveforms rather than just travel times. Um, and this is um, work from, from Kai Tao and Steve Grand. And they're looking at the Western Pacific. And um, these are the earthquakes that are in their model. And these are all the stations um, in, in Eastern Asia that they're using. And if we were to look at this model of um, the subduction zone, we can see, one, we start to get some very sharp features. Much more pronounced um, low velocity anomalies in the, uppermost, in the upper mantle above the slab where it's subducting. A very sharp slab. This slab has sharp boundaries. It's probably only about 150 kilometers thick here. This is approaching um, uh, something more consistent with what we think about the incoming plate that goes into subduction zones rather than a lot of the um, earlier tomography that we see. And we might be able to pick up more details about, say, how the slab interacts with boundaries. It doesn't appear to care too much about the 410 here. And then we've already heard a bit about how the slab may be affected by um, changes in uh, viscosity and density um, near 660, as well as surrounding flow. Um, so I want to um, sort of move on to look at one example of where this could tell us something about slab morphology, and I'll use one that I'm more familiar with. Um, here we'll look at some tomography using Earthscope data from uh, the western U.S., so using these stations up here. Um, many different models with these data, so we can get a sense of, of sort of how well they agree across different methods. Um, but what enables it is really this wide aperture 70 kilometers spacing. 
70 kilometers means the rays won't interact very shallow, so we can't do great body wave tomography of the crust with this. But below about 100 kilometers depth, these images start to have good crossing rate coverage. And here this is using sort of an intermediate step on the methods I've described where we're using approximate finite frequency sensitivity kernels, not calculating them with full elastic 3D synthetics, um, and, and keeping that gradient-based inversion. And so beneath this section, we can see where velocities are a bit faster and where they're a bit slower. And we see some obvious artifacts up here in that the slab appears to come up almost vertically beneath the arc, which is clearly wrong. But we don't have um, the data to be able to uh, essentially get it right with just body wave travel times in this setting. We'd have to bring in something else like surface waves or scattered wave imaging, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Where this can have some power for understanding how subduction works is with the interaction between then those seismic images and um, geodynamic modeling. And I'm not necessarily going into advocating a, a particular um, process-based result, but just kind of illustrating this path. So in this case, this is a forward modeling approach applied to the western U.S. or northwestern U.S. subduction since 40 million years ago. This is work from Lejeune Liu and Dave Stegman. And so what they've done, this is a little bit of a mixed model in that they're imposing plate motion at the surface. And this is something that you should have um, a, a healthy degree of skepticism about how that influences the model. But we would like models that do fit plate motion. So they're, they're, uh, there's give and take there. And what they're doing over on the right is showing a bunch of different Earthscope based tomography models. And all of them have some slab. And a lot of them, the slab looks like it's maybe broken into segments. And it was kind of a strange looking slab to people when we first saw it. And this is probably the simplest looking section of it. So we're starting to say, how hard would it be to reproduce in a dynamic model this observational um, image of a slab? Is this anything like what we would predict? And so they were tuning the models or sort of guess and check forward modeling to see what it would take. And they end up finding that some fairly conventional parameters can, can fit this. And what they're doing here is just um, comparing the geometry as the slab goes through time. They can see that whole evolution because they're modeling it. And then they're just comparing the 0MA image to all of these tomography images on the right. Um, so where this can start to be informative is to say, take different models and think about um, how can we change some of the mechanical parameters and do they match our observational data from tomography better or worse? So in this case, they try and changing a few. This is something that uh, Magli talked about much more skillfully yesterday. Um, but in this example, we could just see three different versions of messing with the asthenospheric viscosity. And so they're saying, do we make the asthenosphere a whole lot weaker um, or do we make it, say, two orders of magnitude or one order of magnitude? And what would that do to the slab geometry? What if we changed the, the slab viscosity? What if we changed the transition zone viscosity? And they can look at how each of those affect the different parameters. And the main thing I'd say, which um, if I could get it to go, is that these end up being non-unique, but they can give us some feel for which parameters are more and less important if we can see um, slabs at this scale. I think one of the most surprising things and one of the more um, interesting ones from a perspective of the geology at the surface is that they're able to use this model to think about how it could explain some big events in Western US tectonics and magmatism. So in this case, how a hotspot track might be linked to changes in subduction. Um, so one thing that was going on in the Western US during the time period of all these images is that right around 15 million years ago, um, the Columbia River basalts erupted, Steen's basalts erupted, a number of large silicic eruptions occurred nearby, and that is essentially taken to be the start of the Yellowstone hotspot track. So this map, what's outlined in red, these are all the big silicic and basaltic volcanic centers that started up almost at the same time, around 17 to 16 million years ago. So it's sort of like this strange line source of volcanism hit part of the western US. And it's right at the edge of the Precambrian portion of the continent. And so people have looked at this event for a long time, but they kind of get to take a new look because we have 
the large scale seismic images of the slab morphology coupled with this, these geodynamic models. And if we go back here, as they were looking at this model, we see a couple of things. Um, the trench retreat, which Magali talked about, might not be the, the full story for what um, slabs are doing to get them to sort of flatten out, but it's one aspect of the uh, Cascadia subduction zone. And what we see here in the, uh, the Miocene is that this is the time period, give or take a million years would be fine, or a few million years would be fine for this sort of model, but this, at this time period they actually have this slab breaking. There is no plume in this model. They didn't introduce a weakness at that point in the slab, but it's something that could come out of the parameters that are fitting the tomography otherwise. Um, so this is interesting because people have looked at this event for a long time. This is kind of a dramatic view of it. I don't think the, the slab sort of splintered like buckshot when something hit it, but um, there was a pretty big event. You go from no magmatic activity to large igneous provinces um, and, and major caldera forming events at about 16 million years ago, and they're seeing this slab break then. Um, this is something people had looked at for a long time and said, well, maybe the plume activity, maybe this hot, buoyant upwelling that's fed the hotspot track was enough to break the slab so that the heat and the vertical load of the plume could break it. This is an interesting twist because it's saying this slab is so young and weak and the rheological parameters in this region and kinematic parameters are such that it might break anyway. Um, so it gives us a, a new view. The breaking anyway can explain some aspects of that pulse of volcanism, but then we need something else to keep the Yellowstone hotspot track going. So there's probably a bit of both in here, but it's something that, that people are still looking at. So mostly I went through this to give you an idea of one, how the tomography works, what are some of our different options out there, but then once we can see large scale slab morphology, what would we do with it? And I think some of the things I'd like to know with subduction zones are, can plumes break slabs? If so, is that restricted to young slabs? Is that restricted to slabs that are rolling back? Um, anything else? Do slabs often break in the absence of plumes? Do they just break anyway? That's what that model was suggesting. So often we expect this nice coherent slab-like feature to be maintained after it subducts. Maybe. Um, maybe that's not the case. The one thing I didn't get into in order to be able to cover a little more ground is to look at the along strike variations, which were not able to fit very well yet in the western US. Those images are a mess along strike, and so we've kind of focused on the easiest place to explain them. So how would those along strike variations um, in the plate maybe be related to the upper plate or be related to other aspects of, of regional or global mantle flow? And I think there are a lot of recent insights. These are definitely questions people are working on, um, and they're, they're tractable with the kind of data that we have. They're tractable with the kinds of geodynamic models we can run, um, but there's a lot of exciting stuff to pursue. So the, the next kind of jump down in scale that I had at the beginning is to look at scattered wave imaging of subduction zones. I should just say, on, in terms of the tomography and the large scale slab structure, any questions? Yeah, Thurston. Just a comment on your last point as to the first thing, you know, how easy is it to, to break the, the slab and in the computations you just showed, the slab can basically have arbitrary strength because the breaking happens because of the change in plate motions. It's the same mechanism that I illustrated yesterday when I showed Earth Hans movies from 2001. Once you change the motion, you just shove the thermal boundary layer into the mantle in a different direction, and that cross-section, then it looks like it's sheared. So, so if you want to get at the strength of the slab and the breaking, I think you need to make sure that the kinematic boundary conditions don't just control the whole system behavior. So that's a, a good point um, with, with Thorsten's insight into the kinematic parameters dominating there. But then we, we still ask the question, all right, we have some constraints on plate motion, especially just for the last few tens of millions of years. Is that kind of change in plate motion always going to lead to this kind of break? I think that we, we don't know. Um, this is maybe a favorable case. Maybe that's not even what happened here. Uh, so we could look at this kind of large scale blobby structure like these sorts of images on the right, or we might be interested depending on the kind of science we do and more localized um, interface structure. 
And so we end up approaching the seismic imaging problem um, very differently to focus on that interface structure. So one of the things you could ask is, why is this even separate from tomography? Can't you just apply the seismic method and give me your image? And often we don't have data that are equally sensitive to all these different aspects of the model. So when we look at scattered waves, it's very localized sensitivity to an interface, some change in velocity that's somewhere at depth, and almost no information about what's in between that strange thing and the surface. Um, you can get some information about what's between if you also apply things like the, the tomography. So it's very different than path integrated sensitivity. It's telling us about some sharp change deeper in the Earth. And if we want to make 3D images this way, because it's not a path integrated quantity, it's um, there are even more stringent requirements for the kind of sampling geometry we need it to get a high quality image. So that can be limiting. The thing that's powerful, and I'm going to look at the, the passive source or earthquake based side, is that big earthquakes sample the whole earth. Um, and they're going on all the time. So if we can look beneath receivers and listen to greater than magnitude 5 to 6 earthquakes, these can hit any, any interface we're interested in. We're not limited by, say, the depth penetration of active sources or something like that. And just to give an idea of, of what's in here, um, teleseismic P waves, like this blue and black band, we could look at them as being very simple at the start. And often when we look at a teleseismic P waveform, it could just be a few wiggles and then really quiet down. But there's a lot in the coda. So right now we're seeing that blue and black wave start to interact with the surface, start to interact with the slab moho, the top of the slab. This would be the base or the, the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary of a slab. This is just a cartoon subduction model. But we're looking at what started as this very simple P wave. And now we've got a whole lot of things happening here in the coda that are all reflections of these sharp interfaces. This simple subduction zone model has a slab crust, a mantle lithosphere that's one layer, um, some slower wedge, some really slow nose to the wedge. These are just a couple polygons thrown in here. We've got maybe five or six different flavors of velocity. Presumably, Earth's subduction zones have um, even more complexity than this. But even in this simple thing, we can really see a lot going on. And so we'd like to be able to map all of this activity all of these phases back to where they came from and get maybe a more vivid image of the sharp parts of subduction zones. And I should say the, the work that I'll present on scattered wave imaging is, is really led by Steve Hansen, a postdoc at UNM and, and soon to be a faculty member at Macquarie University. So if we just stopped those frames and aligned on the P wave, we'd see a whole bunch of things in the coda. And like I said, our goal is to find out where all this stuff came from. We can see some dipping that are obviously related to the slab. We can see some flat that might be related to the MOHO structure. If we looked at a teleseismic S wave, I didn't show the movie for that, but we could see the same case. There'd be some arrivals that come in early now, because if an S wave converts to a P wave, the P wave actually beats it to the surface, because the P velocity is faster. So we have some action out in the negative time for that reason. There are also big later coda arrivals, which people are starting to use more and more often now. So I'll, I'll mostly look at P to S um, scattering. And the way we do this is to, to use what we call receiver functions. That's just another word for a Green's function, assuming your source is coming from below, that it's steeply incident. So what's the, re the, the response to a point force beneath the receiver is what the receiver function is. And we could see a number of different arrivals, even if we had a structure that was just as simple as a crust over a mantle. We could see this direct P to S conversion. So the dashed lines are S waves. The solid lines are P waves. We could see what I'll call um, 2P 1S, or two solid lines, one dashed line. It could hit the free surface, bounce, and then backscatter at the crust mantle boundary. Or you could get two S legs and one P leg. And there are multiple ways you could draw that. I've just chosen one of the options. Um, and so we could look at what would happen then if we saw these arrivals in a receiver function. We're going to get rid of the P wave. So at time 0 would be the P wave, and we don't see it. Then we see this PS arrival come in a little later, 2P1S because P waves are faster than S waves. 2S1P comes in later because the S waves are slower. 
And so for a 1D model, we could think about mapping all of this time series to depth. And this is an example for just a, a 38 kilometer thick kind of continental crust. And each of these wave types are in the different colors. And if we wanted, we could even stack all of them together and we'd get this composite or, or black wave form where we'd get something perky at the moho, but we'd also get a little bit of, of falsely migrated energy. So we would need to be aware that the timing, uh, aware of the timing of when these different modes arrive to interpret that right. Um, you can also do this with P multiples. Sometimes people call those virtual reflections, usually because they've come from active source to, um, studies, but it's the same idea as these. They just three P legs through the crust. We can look at different ways to make images here. So this is kind of like ray theory travel time tomography, is to say, to start with, let's just map these back to their conversion points and stack the waveforms. This is our, our simpler approach, and it's one that's often um, adequate for the kind of data we have. So this is a figure from, from Rondine that's nice. It's uh, focused on um, P to S conversion. So if we looked at the area sampled here, it's kind of this expanding cone with depth. If we're looking in the crust, it's maybe only 20 kilometers wide at the Moho, so it's pretty localized sensitivity. If we look down to 100 kilometers depth, maybe we're interested in something like the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. It's getting a little wider, 70. If we're interested in the transition zone, it could be something like 500 kilometers wide. Once we start getting kind of crossfire here between different stations, these images can really start to improve. When they're by themselves like this, we might as well just stack the individual trace and take a look at it. Or we could see if it varies with azimuth, but we can't necessarily make a good 3D image. Um, there would be a lot of blank space in it. We should remember this would get wider if we went back to the case with the multiples where they're bouncing multiple times in the crust. And so this is a suitable approximation for locally 1D structure. Say we just have a sub-horizontal moho in the continent, not too bad. Transition zone structure, quite good for discontinuities that are present everywhere. When we want to look at more complicated features in subduction zones, there are definitely going to be some that are dipping. Um, there are going to be some that are truncated, and this is then not going to do so well. Um, an example of where it's not too bad, this is to take a little over 2,000 stations from the US and try and map out the MOHO in this way. So we could take the P to S conversions, and the blue stripe would be a velocity increase with depth, and we could see it kind of coast to coast here at um, 36 degrees latitude, going from central California over to North Carolina. We could do the same thing with the 2P1S, the 2S1P. We could even just smash them all together and take the average, and we could start to see this image. We would know, again, there's going to be some artifacts up here because of the different timing of all these modes. Um, but it can work pretty well. In this case, it's a little bit of a reach to make it a 3D image because those stations are 70 kilometers apart. So 20 kilometer width at the Moho, there's a lot of daylight between those different stations. So this is really just interpolated together into an image. It's not um, something that we could apply a more sophisticated algorithm to and get anything better out. Where we've had quite a bit of success, people applying methods largely um, introduced by um, Michael Bostock and Stefan Rondine is to take more of a migration approach or a more accurate depropagation of the wave field. Um, and that's been useful in subduction zones. And we could think about doing this in two ways. There's sort of this forward approach where we might take, say we have this receiver function and it has a wiggle here. We're, ask, we're going to basically back project or migrate that wiggle into the subsurface knowing that it could have come from anywhere along this contour because it would hit the station at the same time. And all we know is that the wiggle came in at this time. So that's one approach where we sort of spray these things backward. The other way we could do it is say we're concerned with one image point, x here, and then go into the data and stack all the data along some curve here and plot the stacked value at that image point. So that would be a, another approach. We need to apply a number of corrections for the ray geometry because actually the sign of this wiggle could change if we hit it from different angles. Um, but we can do all of that 
And the way this has been done so far, these are still assuming 1D background velocities, and they're essentially rooted in ray theory. So they're not going to take into account things like the blobby 3D structure we've been seeing. They're only going to image the sharp parts. And these are the, the bottom method is um, this sort of GRT inversion that has become quite popular is what, what I'll show on the next slide. And I think this, um, to me, it's, um, awesome. It's a, a seminal experiment in seismology. This was put out by John Nablick and others in 1993. Um, sobering that I was in third grade, and this is still the best passive source imaging line of a subduction zone that we have. Um, I didn't even hear about it at the time. <laughs> but this, this thing sat around for a while, right? And then in 2002, Bostock and Rondonet applied this migration approach, this GRT inversion. And what they found is, one, they could map out a lot of complicated interfaces pretty well, and that some of them were truncated, right? They weren't going to fit the simple CCP approach. Some things like what you could interpret as the basaltic crust ended. Okay, that's cool. Maybe we're actually imaging metamorphic processes. That's outstanding. We can see what's probably the, the moho in the oceanic plate go, going down. We can see the continental moho here. And then all of a sudden, it just goes away. Um, so a lot of ideas came out of this. One, that this um, could be a, a great demonstration that we might have serpentinized or a, a high concentration of hydrous minerals in the nose of the mantle wedge, where it would be cold and possibly accepting a lot of volatiles from the slab. Um, but this was a, a remarkable array. It's five to eight kilometer spacing. Um, I assume John just didn't take no for an answer in terms of moving off the line, right? You, you, if, if, I, I don't know how he got it quite that straight. Um, it's still probably the best example of that that we have. I would say that means it's probably time for a substantial jump forward because we're not limited by um, the teleseismic wave field. And I'll try and illustrate that a little bit in the next few slides. So um, we're trying to do this a little bit differently. This is, again, from, from Steve Hansen, uh, a postdoc, soon to be faculty member. Um, and this will give us the exact same answer as what Stefan Rondonet and Mike Bostock and others have been getting for years in a 2D case where we have a simple 1D background velocity model. And I think the strength of it is just a little different way to view what these are sensitive to and a little bit more natural way to extend this to different scales or to extend it to 3D. So if we were to look at analogous sort of sensitivity kernels from travel times using this sort of adjoint approach, we could calculate those for P to S scattering kernels. And for the P to S or for S to P um, or P multiples, we could do that for each of these. We see that it's a lot not quite so simple as the CCP approach, where we would stack all the energy at that star. Right? We have a blue swing here along this, this arcuate shape. It's actually red out here, meaning that the sign of the sensitivity changes, whether our scatter is located here or there. So if we had both, they would just cancel out. That would be unfortunate. If we had the same thing for SP, we can see that it's now this a little bit wider angle, but these limbs of sensitivity are bent downward instead of upward because of, the, because of the relative velocity of the P and the S waves. And then we could see that the multiples are actually really useful for imaging sub-horizontal interfaces because their sensitivities are wide and much flatter. Um, that's part of the reason they work so well to, say, image the MOHO across the US. They do some more lateral averaging. And so they're useful for us there. The P waves, if we could have really dense sensitivity, or sorry, really dense spacing, we could see very sharp features because they go from flat all the way up to vertical in their sensitivity. So we could see a diverse range of, of structural geometries this way. Um, these are applying it to synthetic data, so we kind of know what we're doing. So we take this cartoon model of the subduction zone that I showed you a wave field for earlier, and in this case, we apply the, the GRT method from, from Rondonet et al. And we recover much, well, we recover the slab top very well. We see this little warp down because there's this low velocity area in the mantle wedge. Remember, this is based on a 1D background model. So it, it doesn't map the velocity structure. It just finds the sharp parts. We can see that the moho is bright here. It's dim here. 
We could even potentially see the bottom of a slab if it was as simple and sharp as it is in my cartoon. Um, in the adjoint scattering approach, maybe this looks a little cleaner, but it's not terribly different. The things that are sort of functionally different are that we can put in any tomography model you want and then migrate through that. Um, and it could be 3D, it could scatter from out of plane. Um, and so we would not have this sort of artificial bump because of the, the low velocity zone in, in the nose of the mantle wedge, which we've just prescribed. We could look at different modes. This is just the PS sensitivity. This is the 2P1S sensitivity. Um, that one turns out to be a little more sensitive to density, the reflections. So we see a little bit more action because we've played with the density in the nose of the mantle wedge here. That's not reality. It's just what we put in to see um, what, how this would perform. So small improvements, but I think what is exciting that you could do with it is go more toward 3D. We always do this in 2D. We also do it at pretty low frequencies compared to what's possible now. Um, and in this implementation, it still stays pretty fast because those kernels are ray-based. We've compared them with full synthetic kernels, and um, they compare pretty well unless you get crazy with the velocity models. These are artifacts in both. And so they're a little bit brighter over here because it doesn't have a 3D, or it doesn't have, in this case, the lateral velocity variations. So if you correctly account for the travel times, those things will not stack as coherently in this approach as they will in here. But it's a little rigged, right, because we know the velocity model perfectly. So if we were taking observational tomography, presumably, presumably it's better than knowing nothing, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, so limits for doing this. Um, why bring this up? We could look at teleseismic earthquakes like this one. This is the, these are a bunch of individual, individual station spectra in the red and a median in the black. These are the noise spectra for those stations. We have really good signal noise all the way off the edge of this image, which is two and a half hertz. Often we could do that, see that to three or four hertz. Earth provides us that all the time. Now, these migration images we see of subduction zones mostly rely on energy below a half hertz. A lot of them even filter the data down to below 0.3 hertz, meaning we could almost go for a 10x decrease in wavelength based on the source that Earth's providing all the time, if we wanted. Maybe there are targets we want to see. Um, there's also a lot of room to improve in that we're looking at 2D images, essentially all the time. And it's a 3D world, and we're getting very interested particularly in a long strike variations in these kinds of processes and subduction zones. So we're, we've really been at this level for a long time, and I think it would be exciting to be able to acknowledge a third dimension or that we could possibly go even an order of magnitude finer in resolution, but it would take a heck of a lot of stations. Um, on the bright side, they do not need to be broadband seismometers, but we do need thousands of them. Um, and I, I don't think that's um, too crazy to say. So to give a little simple look at what this even looks like in 2D, if we went to one kilometer spacing, and here we're just using a 0.8 hertz P wave. So a little bit higher frequency than we typically use, but kind of in the normal range for now. One hertz, obviously this is beautiful, or sorry, one kilometer spacing. We recover most of the structure beautifully. There's a little bit of, um, um, a little bit of distortion in the shallow crust, a little bit of these, these artifacts here. If we add noise, these are noise levels based on average characteristics for um, receiver function data used um, for the US array data set. So a fairly realistic level of noise. This is still pretty robust. There's a little bit of speckle in it, but we're seeing the features we'd want to see, even getting some sense of this vertical wall here, if it might exist. Um, five kilometer spacing looks good, which is why that, that image works so well from um, Bostock and others, they were essentially using less than 0.5 hertz, so even a little lower frequency, which would do some smoothing of this and get rid of the, the high frequency choppiness. If we were to drop down to 10 kilometers, it's going to start getting rougher to see more subtle features, like maybe the base of the slab, if there is such a thing and it is sharp. Um, it'll get harder to see, maybe impossible to see if there's this vertical wall here, but we'll still have some sense of change maybe in the MOHO amplitude. 
these get increasingly um, unrealistic as we go down to something like 20 kilometers. Um, so I think there's room to um, go um, forward with this. One way to ask that, though, is do we think things like this vertical wall even exist? Um, I think most of you would agree that subduction zones are very complicated, but I just want to look at one example of where I think we see some um, interesting hints that there are extremely sharp features down there and we might want to be able to image them. And so this, this is going to leverage data from a large project that was planned um, without my involvement. Um, this is what, what ended up being called the IMUSH or Imaging Magma under Mount St. Helens. I'm just showing the active source project. Alan Lavander is the PI for that. And there are going to be, there were 23 shots in 2014 at all these stars. And each shot was recorded by about 3,000 geophones. Some of them moved from initially being the blue dots to becoming the red dots. The magenta ones sat there the whole time. I should add that there's a lot more going on in this project, even if we only look at the seismic side. There are folks from University of Washington, Rice, Cornell involved. They were the folks who planned it along with USGS. I was sort of a late addition to put in those magenta dots. Um, so there's a broadband array and those orange triangles now added on with the active source experiment. And the part I added was to put in a bunch of these rapidly deployable instruments. This is kind of an older version now, but um, it's an autonomous seismograph or node, cable-free seismograph if you want, all in one package that's the size of maybe a big, you know, like a Costco-sized soup can if you want. Um, and, and it's got a stake on the bottom and you can install one in about 60 seconds if all is going well. Um, GPS in it, so it's a good clock, high dynamic range in the digitizer, geophone, battery life. Um, why this is so empowering is the other way to deploy thousands of sensors on land is this, right? And that looks terrible even if you have permission to go across that whole field and stretch miles of cable, but no one's going to let us stretch miles of cable over active volcanoes if we could even do it. Um, also, if you've ever installed outdoor Christmas lights, you have an idea of sort of the weaknesses in this system, right? You don't really want that much cable laying around on Earth. So we stayed on the trails in the wilderness and some logging roads and we got this sort of spider web looking array with about 900 seismometers in it within a um, uh, 15 kilometer radius of Mount St. Helens. And to get back to the um, sort of subduction question and those sharp features, what I'm looking at here are the offset gathers for the active source shots. So these were big explosions. You drill a well um, tens of meters deep and set off something like 1,000 to 2,000 pounds of blasting gel. They record as about magnitude one to two earthquakes, at least on a local scale. Big P wave, if we stack the data in these distance bins, so distance increasing to the right, time increasing down. A little S wave, something there, but um, fairly typical for explosions. And then this hyperbolic arrival, which would be the MOHO reflection. And these are very high frequency waves in, in my world, 15 to 25 hertz. And if we were to look at these, we could just stack individual shots. So if this is one of those 1,000 pound shots, we could stack, do a normal move out correction, which just says if there's a 1D interface at depth, it should show up. If, if there's reflections from it, it should show up at the right depth here. So we see this nice peak in energy at about 40 kilometers. The middle one would go to that shot. The lower one would go to that shot. They're all there, which is good. We expect a crust mantle boundary. And if we go just to the other side of the array, remember we've only gone 25 kilometers west, these are now um, go all absent. And these are median stacks of more than 1,000 traces. So if there's a little whiff of something in there, we would see it. Um, so it's effectively negligible. You might be able to look along a dense line, and a seasoned analyst would be able to pick it for a few stations. Um, but you can't just take kind of a bulk approach and see anything anymore. And so if we were to look at this in a more regional context, we could make a map of MOHO reflectivity. Black is effectively nothing. Red to, to yellow is more, more of a normal continental MOHO. And this line that separates the two kind of runs right beneath Mount St. Helens. If we looked at it in cross-section from southwest to northeast, it would be kind of here. I've added these deep long period earthquakes as sort of ornaments on there to, to hint at the fact that 
perhaps these might end up being related, but they, they might not be at all. And I'll, I'll get there in a, in a minute. Um, but this, just in terms of raw data, is an impressively sharp transition that we could go from a shot here and see nothing, and then go to a shot here, and we see this bright um, MOHO arrival. We're far from the only people to see um, evidence of a dim MOHO. This is an example, a dim MOHO in the fore arc of Cascadia. This is an, is an example from Shen et al. Um, in 2013. And they use one transportable array broadband out here, EO5. And this is their surface wave and receiver function inversion. So it's all VS, it's surface waves, it's receiver functions. It has nothing to do with the P waves from the explosions that I was just showing. And you see the velocity increase going down, a big step at the MOHO, maybe a little bit of a, a lid or mantle lithosphere, if you like, and then it gets slow again, kind of slow velocities that are typical of, of an arc somewhere there might be melt, something like 4.2 kilometers a second. If we look down at FO4A into the four arc just southwest of here, our whole array lives in a third of the space between. Um, then we see that the lower crust might be a little fast, the uppermost mantle, or whatever it is, stays very slow down to something like 55 kilometers depth before it gets up to even a little faster velocities than we see out here. Presumably, this is starting to get to slab depths for the black line. Um, but there is no sharp interface at that location. Um, these are two TA stations nearby. But there have been lots of studies over the years that are kind of shown in this plate boundary configuration, so the Juan de Fuca Ridge, subduction zone starts here, slab contours, all the green boxes are areas people have re reported low reflectivity of the four arc moho. And I think our little postage stamp is essentially just parked on that boundary. But what it's telling us is that it's an incredibly sharp boundary. Over just a few kilometers laterally, we're going from seeing a full MOHO reflection to nothing, and we have something like 100 reflection points per square kilometer. Um, so it would fit in nicely with these kinds of results and just say that we're living kind of right here. If we were to look at central Oregon by analogy or just a little bit farther north by analogy um, in, in Washington, we see the same sort of absence of a MOHO in these images. Where this could be neat is to be able to um, think about what's causing it. Um, there may well be other explanations if the prevailing one, that is this is the edge of serpentinized, um, cor of the edge of the serpentinized sort of nose of the mantle wedge, then that would actually be mapping a phase boundary. We'd be mapping the edge of the integrite stability field. And so if that's true, we're looking at one isotherm beneath an arc volcano. So a long strike for this little distance, we could see that there's a very sharp boundary where it should be something like 700 degrees. Maybe it's a different hydrous mineral and it's chlorite and it's 800, but these are knowable things. We could, we could test that hypothesis. How does that work with at least some um, estimates of the thermal structure of subduction zones? This is from Syracuse et al. for the Cascades. And if we just shade in the less than 700 degree region in Park Mount St. Helens, it's not bad. Um, all these deep long period earthquakes are back here at the edge. And then the other ornament I've thrown on here is from Eric Kaiser's active source tomography with the IMUSH data, where he finds a deep crustal low velocity anomaly that's offset to the east from Mount St. Helens. So what's striking about this is it's a very cold temperature for me to be hypothesizing beneath an active volcano at the MOHO, 700 degrees. There are melts as hot as 900 degrees that have come out the top. Um, so it could be telling us something very interesting about how melt is routed up, and this would kind of be our preferred path. People have also suggested some mid-crustal connections. Um, I would say this is more deference to the literature than my opinion. I'd stick more with something like this as a, as a best guess at how to explain this right now. This is the tomography view from Eric Kaiser. Again, those are now the deep long period earthquake switched colors. But this low velocity zone in the lower crust is offset to the southeast. This is this line. So it's out here southeast of Mount St. Helens, maybe accepting mantle melt inputs um, that have been moving up into the west um, toward the active volcano. The last part that I'll, I'll try to go through quickly is, a, is much different than structural imi imaging. But I just want to point out where um, some of these dense arrays of sort of cheaper instruments can um, maybe show us some other interesting results that relate to 
um, could relate to fluids move, making their way through subduction zones. So we'll take a look at, at trying to image volcano micro seismicity. And when we look at all of that node data, um, we could see earthquakes pretty vividly. So this is time going down. It's about two and a half minutes of data. And then distance from the summit crater increasing to the right. And we can see some earthquakes. These earthquakes were from the PNSN catalog. Um, but within this cluster of earthquakes, there's actually quite a bit more. One way we can just generically search for earthquakes is actually to take something like that migration approach, or in this case, it's just a kinematic back projection, and play all the data backwards. So if you think of hearing me talk to you, well, the noise is actually coming from the speakers, so this is not right. But if it were just coming from my mouth, and you thought about all of you recording it, you could play it backward. And the only place it would stack coherently is right here. Anywhere else, it wouldn't add up coherently. So that's kind of what we're doing, is just playing all of the data backward and then seeing where we find earthquakes or where we find energy sort of pile up in the subsurface beneath Mount St. Helens. And we do this continuously. Again, Steve Hansen's contributions do this for 120 million time samples over the um, couple of weeks of data. And you can see those earthquakes and how we can sort of localize them. This is even for a magnitude negative 2. I wouldn't say that this is the end point for analyzing the earthquakes, but one of the challenges with big data sets is how do you get started? And what we could do is get a set of events here that we could then move on to use as templates to look for more, or that we could use as starting estimates of the location to do higher resolution relative relocation techniques. Um, and so that's um, something we could go farther with. If we just took the reverse time imaging locations, they stack up in a very reasonable way. They don't look much different than the catalog for a couple of years beneath Mount St. Helens, yet this is from two weeks. Almost all of them, if you look at them in map view, this is our sort of inner ring of nodes, the summit crater here. There's a very high concentration of events in just one 500 meter pixel in map view. That looks like a nearly sub-vertical conduit to me. Uh, if we look at it in, in cross-section, we see it's maybe spread up to a kilometer wide, but pretty localized, and we could do more with um, cross-correlation techniques once we have events already identified. And this is taking that cross-correlation approach to detect even more. If we do that, we could take our initial set and turn it into more than 1,000 events. Um, this is from Zhao Feng um, at, uh, at University of Washington and that temporal distribution of, of 1,000 events through the um, 12 days or so of, of that network. What was interesting about this and why I bring it up for um, our purposes is that we got some surprises by just automatically detecting these earthquakes. We saw a whole bunch of typical earthquakes. If you move your detection threshold downward, you expect to see more of the same. That's not terribly surprising. So we saw a lot more of these what we call volcanic tectonic, or you could say normal earthquakes. And so here's three seconds for scale, an impulsive P wave, an impulsive S wave. We also saw these long period signals that are often thought to go on during times of unrest or eruption, but generally not during quiescent times at St. Helens. Yet we saw a couple of these per day. Um, and this is an example of what the, the normal ones look like. If you just take your eye to the spectrogram, time increases down, and this is 1 to 100 hertz we can see they excite the whole frequency range. If we move on to, if I'm allowed to move on to, we're going to let this spin for a minute. Hmm. Please. Not sure where to go with the spinning wheel. <laughs> We're going to reopen that. But questions are certainly welcome, especially in the next minute or so. Can you be sure it's not just all coming from like a single point? 
Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. The depth uncertainty is definitely bigger because we only have vertical component recordings. Um, for some of these, we've gone in and made S minus P picks from the station in the in the summit crater, and that um, that refines the depths much more. Um, we have uncertainties from the reverse time imaging on the locations. Most of them are plus minus a kilometer or so, and we see most of those hypocenters spread out over about five to six kilometers of depth. So, yeah, there may be more clustering than we know about, um, but they're probably spread out over at least three to five kilometers, something like that. Um, so the odd earthquakes that I was talking about, what's happened here from the last slide is that I've cut the frequency scale in half, and now this is an earthquake that only makes it maybe a third of the way up the new one. So this kind of signal is usually not studied if we see it on the permanent network stations, which are these stations around Mount St. Helens. This is an envelope stack from the node stations surrounding the mountain. We see that this is basically strong below 10 hertz, and it lasts um, an unusual amount of time, and that these things are going on pretty frequently. What's interesting is that their locations, if we look at the LP ones, the yellow ones, they're mixed in with the normal earthquakes. Um, often, for, for the strongest examples, we can see that they're located within less than a kilometer of each other, even if we make um, the, the, the best manual picks that we can. So we get a little room to blame path effects, but not a lot. Um, it might be possible that there are very strong heterogeneities over just hundreds of meters. That's completely reasonable in a volcano. But for the most part, we can't say path effects are the reason that the spectra are so different. And if we look at a couple of these strong, stronger LP events on a broadband station nearby, their displacement spectra they basically look smooth. They're not like resonant LP earthquakes at erupting volcanoes. They're long period, but they don't have these harmonic peaks in the spectrum. Now, the, the, the scale's different. This is a log scale in frequency, but if it had these peaks, you'd be looking for spikes that were an order of magnitude tall out in this, um, sorry, out in this part of the, uh, of the spectrum. And we have uh, about 20 or so of these events, and they look to have kind of normal, smooth displacement spectra, but extremely low corner frequencies. So we have some options in terms of how we explain that, but if we were to think of them as shear failure, we could start to think that maybe we're identifying areas that only support very low stress drops or have very low rupture velocities, or it's a completely different mechanism. But in this case, it's a type of activity that we didn't know was going on. Um, why it's kind of interesting is that during this experiment, we actually had sort of an uptick in seismicity. And some of this is confusing because people were looking at the network data a little more carefully then. But if you were to look at, from the PNSN website, seismicity beneath Mount St. Helens over several years, you see it's normally humming along at something like a handful of earthquakes per day. We had kind of a cluster of, of more active times um, during this experiment in mid-2014. There was an even more prominent cluster in early 2016. And um, at least the, the folks who have been monitoring Mount St. Helens look at these as potential times when there might be a bit of recharge. And they have some reasons to think that there's gradual recharge going on over the past several years just from GPS and from changes in the focal mechanisms of earthquakes. I'd say it's quite uncertain, but we wonder if is this normal that we see a few LP earthquakes per day? Is it restricted to this time? That's something we really don't know yet because we recorded for such a short duration. Um, I'd note that actually the two strongest LPs were both right at the beginning of this sequence, and then we saw many fewer at the end. But the statistics on this would be terrible because it's so small. So we don't really know what's going on, but there are some interesting hints, and we want to try and go forward with using template-based detections to find out if these events kept going on after. We could also look at if they were going on before, and that's um, work in progress from Margaret Glasgow, a, a student at New Mexico. What's interesting is it might not just be weirdness of Mount St. Helens. One other place that I know of that has a dense geophone array, they have an array of about 40 geophones on the side of Mount Vesuvius that continually beam form earthquakes. And as soon as they put this out, they realized that tremor, tremor and low-frequency earthquakes were going on all the time at very low magnitudes. 
Um, and I wonder if maybe Mount St. Helens is not terribly different. In this case, they were seeing this deep low frequency earthquakes and tremor deep for them was only four to six kilometers, um, not terribly different. And then VT seismicity above it, ours are all mixed in together. And then we have DLP earthquakes way down here. Um, but anywhere so far, the, the couple places people have put these things at volcanoes that aren't doing anything spectacular now, this might be a way to see if the, the hydrothermal system or if the silicate melt transport system is sort of gurgling away between events. I'd be very interested to know if these events started to become more active or really tapered off and when that happened. So just to finish up, um, I think some questions I'd put out there for mantle wedge structures and magmatic systems. Um, I think there's still a lot that's unknown about the, the, this corner of the wedge. Um, we've had some careful work published earlier this year that this should be maybe only possible in places like Cascadia that are warm enough, they're dehydrating rapidly and could hydrate the wedge in just the 40 million year life of the Cascade subduction zone. But there are hints that there are weird low velocity compositions or materials present at other subduction zones. So how do we explain them? Um, I'd like to know how, how sharp some of these features are in other settings. And maybe they would help us explain how melt is actually routed from where it's hot enough to get substantial quantities of melt in the wedge up into the crust beneath arc volcanoes. Um, and once it's in the crust, some of the things that I haven't talked about but I think are great open questions are really how often and in what quantities is melt transferred from these deep, presumably, differentiation zones in the lower crust to upper crustal magma chambers. I don't think we know too much about those quantities or, or time scales. And if we wanted to look at those, one way I'd do it as a seismologist is to try and wonder when is this long period seismicity going on? We've studied harmonic long, long period seismicity for a long time. It seems like there might be more um, earthquakes going on with strange low frequency spectra. Are they diagnostic of fluids? Are they just a strange version of shear failure that has very low stress drops or something like that? I don't think we really know. Um, if there are different types of LP earthquakes, are there different signals for silicate melt versus shallow hydrothermal processes? Um, all sorts of interesting questions. And then once it does get all the way up in the shallow crust, how could we determine seismically or otherwise geophysically how much eruptable melt actually exists? Those are, those are questions I'm definitely keen to talk about here. Um, so thank you for your attention and hopefully we have um, a good 15, maybe 20 minutes for questions. So uh, when you try to locate the events, use beamforming, do you use 3D velocity structure or um, 1D or homogeneous? Yeah, so for the locations from the reverse time imaging, we were using a 3D tomography model to back project the events. Um, the potential weaknesses are first, tomography is never perfect. Second, this was the tomography from prior to the IMUSH experiment, although um, so it didn't reflect all of the travel times we could measure with the node data in it yet. We used the, the model from Waite and Moran. Um, it has many thousands of earthquakes required, uh, um, recorded by dense arrays around Mount St. Helens in the past, but not all of our data. So better than nothing, but probably not perfect. A follow-up is uh, do you use uh, the envelope function to back project or the raw waveforms? Wave so it's a good question. When you back project the data, if you're going to do a kinematic back projection, um, or well, you have many choices about what quantity you back project. In this case, what we found to be very stable was to make an image of median short-term average over long-term average functions. And so we make those STA, LTA functions for all the traces, and then we back project the, them to a point, and we take the median value across the whole array. And we found that that was much more stable because essentially a few elk walking by a few seismometers is much more powerful than a magnitude negative 0.5 earthquake. 
Um, so the mean is a little bit more unwieldy. And all those were about 15 hertz, right? I didn't catch the last part. F 15 hertz. Is that the, did you filter the data? I think 7 to 35 hertz was the filter that was applied for the data before doing the back projection. That was where most local earthquakes are very strong, and it's that, that low corner is high enough that regional or teleseismic signals are fairly weak. So kind of choosing it based on those um, desires. Um, so I'm a mineral physicist, so we are interested in comparing experimental data with seismic data. So my question is, say, if we have a mineral phase and we have density and uh, sound velocities, um, some parameters like this, which, um, and I know that um, from your talk that seismic data, there are different methods, they are sensitive to different things. So what kind of, uh, so what kind of data would you recommend to use for a comparison? Yeah, it's a, a, a good thought. How do we interact between having these seismic images and relating them to things like mineral physics measurements? Um, both the scattered wave or localized interface data and the, the tomography data can be useful. With the tomography, the main thing to think of, the main thing that I would think of is that for small features, we're going to get the amplitude wrong our absolute velocities are not going to be that good. So um, I would expect that beneath Mount St. Helens, there's probably some narrower zone. At least that's what the seismicity might suggest, that between 5 and 15 kilometers, there might be a narrow zone that's, that's low velocity. When we image that with tomography, we'll sort of spread it out and diffuse the amplitude of it a bit. Um, so that's um, difficult for a small target. Uh, if I wanted to compare to something in mineral physics, I would go for a really big target, choose the biggest magma reservoirs in the world and look in the middle of them, and um, the values will get closer to reality. Um, so that, that would be one approach. On the interface structure, you know, what we're looking at with the MOHO is essentially saying, what's, what, what changes in composition could you put on the menu that would fully erase the MOHO in a very short distance. One of the things from an experimental side that I'd also think of is if only over a few kilometers we go from a fully bright moho over here and move to the left and get rid of it, um, we'd want to be thinking about processes that uh, can occur very rapidly over, over localized scales. Maybe something changed recently and it hasn't had time to say diffuse, but we'd want things like kinetically fast reactions would be more viable explanations than very slow ones um, in, in that kind of setting. So those are other kinds of things that we could think about. Um, so both the interface structure and the tomography could be useful. I think if we could go to more 3D scattered wave imaging, we might start to get much better ideas of what the edges of magma reservoirs, like that lower crustal blob, might actually look like. How much of a jump in velocity is there at the edge? I would really like to be able to know that rather than just make a smooth image of, of um, sort of the average velocity across some distance. Just a comment. I, th I think another thing that might be worth mentioning is that some types of travel time tomography don't give you the, the absolute velocities. You know, especially if you're if you're doing teleseismic imaging where you're not actually um, taking the right path all the way from the earthquake to the source, um, then you just get you know percentage variation across your array, um, which can be less useful because you don't actually have like an actual p velocity of 6.2. Instead, it's just all relative. <laughs> Yeah, and so if we were to look at that in, in an example and also to give some context for the tutorial, you know, we could look at the local waves recorded by these stations and we get absolute travel times. But we don't have any slab going deeper than the earthquakes that we record. And we really don't have much sampling of the slab. So then we could make the compromise and say, all right, we're interested in large scale slab structure too, but now we're going to need to only get relative times and we could say, see the trajectory of this slab going down into the transition zone but we're looking at plus minus some percent from a reference model. Um, and we actually don't know what that zero value is. Um, so that could float around. We know about the magnitude of variation, but, but that baseline is, um, is floating. 
Uh, that can be improved a bit in areas, at least in the uppermost mantle, where we could say combine the teleseismic body waves with surface waves and um, ground that, that zero value a bit with some absolute measurements. Just to follow up on that point a little bit, I mean, I think an important point about images like that, depending on how you do this, quite often these images are required to average to zero at each depth. So, you know, there's, uh, when you sort of look at that, you can sort of see there's as much red or blue as any given depth. So it becomes much more difficult to understand vertical variations in structure without having the local earthquakes. Yes. Um, so that's. A good point. If you're looking across, this is in 3D, but if you took the whole model and said at any depth what's the average velocity, um, it would go to that zero. That, that is not completely true if the array gets wide enough aperture. So with, say, the US array data where we start to have waves that are sub-horizontal, you actually get net changes in velocity that are offset from zero. The risky part there is our, our least squares algorithms don't like those. They want a normally distributed uh, misfit about zero. So there can be distortion of structure that's introduced by wanting that, um, by, by this sort of demeaned data looking at just perturbations from the average. Um, but sometimes it gives us geometric constraints that, that we wouldn't get otherwise. Well, that was a really good question. Are there more questions from students and postdocs? Um, so how do you um, identify the earthquakes and the long period events? Do you have the same workflow for the migration location and then classify them afterwards? Or is it by looking at different frequency band before you did the location? Yeah, that's a, a good thing to be skeptical of. So we're trying in steps to get better at hunting for them. The first batch that we found and what I've shown you, we mostly found by not looking for them, by looking for the higher frequency pops, and we found some that were lower frequency and longer duration. And what we've been thinking of is how to um, sort of make that, I don't have the figure with me, but make that more automated. And uh, the couple parameters we've been using, and this is something people have done at other volcanoes, is to use sort of balance of how much high frequency and low frequency power is in the signal. So we'll take an average from 1 to 10 hertz, and then from 10 to 40 or 10 to 50. And these events stand out as having really unusual averages compared to most of the seismicity. Um, they also have unusual duration. So we'll make sort of 2D plots of that frequency index or frequency ratio and envelope duration, and then say, those are strange. We should take a closer look. But that, that allows a little bit more automated workflow to um, identify which ones we might um, might want to sort of classify in a different bin. To start, we just looked at the spectrograms and the envelopes and the seismograms for all the earthquakes we detected. And we realized there was um, some spectrum of processes. Most of them cluster in the normal impulsive broadband earthquake realm, but probably about 20% of them were uh, more unusual than that. Any students and postdocs? Okay. I think you showed one figure of your research functions uh, using US array data. I guess, of course, US array data is not perfect for, for research functions, but my impression is using those data and looking at research function, we don't really see clear slab interface. Is that right? Compared to the, to the old one when you were like third grade, so, uh, so the, the old profile. But uh, that one was kind of too short, too short. So I wonder if, US array can somehow improve our image of the slab interface? Um, it has some ability to do that. And I think there was, there was exactly the, uh, well, it, almost exactly the same approach applied to, uh, well, similar approach applied to the Cascadia subduction zone with um, longer period migration of partly the TA data and then also Pascal array data. Um, and when you go beneath the Pascal arrays, it looks really good and you see the slab and you go beneath the TA data, you have to squint at it a little bit more. But there are some hints of slab structure going deeper, particularly if the data are, are migrated. So there is a, a nice paper involving actually the, the Berkeley group that, that showed um, this 
the slab structure going a bit deeper, but it's much better defined if you look beneath these dense Pascal arrays to get image coherence at larger scales. You need lower frequencies and we don't localize it quite so well. And actually the image that I showed here is in California. Um, and if, uh, if we go up to Cascadia, I have the 93 data and the CAFE data and other things in here. And if you just look at it, even just the multi-mode CCP stack looks honestly about the same as the migration image. Um, I guess is, my real question is, do, do we also see the broken of uh, breaking of the, the slab, like your P way of oh, tomography? Yeah, so the breaking of the slab, if you want to think about that in a down dip dimension, we would guess if it does break, it breaks at something like 300 kilometers depth. No one's tracking the slab as a sharp interface below, my opinion, confidently, not much more than 100, 150 kilometers. So its existence as a sharp interface is not clear even over the depth range, which we can see it with tomography. That's because the limited methodology or data, that why, why we couldn't see the slab deeper? I don't know. My, my intuition so far would be to blame the actual slab, that um, it, it doesn't have a sharp interface at 300 kilometers depth at its top, not sharp enough to scatter half hertz or one hertz waves that we might see clearly at the surface. Um, but it could be more about the path in between, that we're not migrating that energy accurately enough to have it stack up well. That's, that's possible. But, but I think the, the brightness of that slab interface for a warm slab like Cascadia um, may, may go away by some depth. And it would be very interesting to, to know that and have that not be a product of, of image quality. It's also that has to do with the, the uh, basalt to eclogite transformation, right? Makes the low velocity crust go away below certain depth, I think, like in Jeff's images and so forth, right? Yes, so it, it's a, it, the interface is much less bright in Cascadia where it's hot. It warms up quickly even below 50 kilometers. But we do see hints of it going deeper um, even in the, um, you know, this sort of image, right? We, we maintain a view of the Juan de Fuca Moho down to 80, 100 kilometers depth. And then we kind of start to, to, to lose it. So it is, we, we see some, I, I would say, pretty clear hints of it going beyond that, that eclogite to basalt transition, but it's nowhere near as, as bright. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the more senior people, if they, well. I, it's a really brief question. Yeah. Is the volcanic arc migrating with time in the Cascades? Uh, it, it is. It is in an interesting way. It's actually rotated such that the north and the south have, have moved in different directions. Um, there's a very, um, interesting paper by Ray Wells and others that came out in the past couple of years about this. Something we've known for a long time that they've refined a bit. Um, the rates of movement are not too dramatic, but I, I don't, do you have an, another idea of how that fits in the, the, the context here? Uh, I was or? just curious if that wedge where you're seeing the really sharp uh, phase change, or possibly a phase change, if it's moving somehow relative to where the volcanoes are. Yeah, I would really like to know that, right? Because if, say, you increased the slab dip or got the slab, the trench to retreat a little bit, then hot mantle would presumably digest, dehydrate some of that hydrated wedge and potentially release some fluids because of it. If it's growing, then you don't really expect fluid release into the lower crust there. So, yeah, it would be really interesting to be able to model, you know, a circumstance where a slab's advancing or retreating and if we see these kinds of features but we might only see them in very young subduction zones, so that makes the menu pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, Brendan, how, how much uh, degassing is going on at, at St. Helens? Is it possible that these long period events you're seeing are basically the signature of the passive degassing? Maybe. Um, very little degassing is going on at Mount St. Helens, at least in a focused way. For a lot of time, there hasn't been a continuously recording um, uh, of gas emissions in the summit crater. And also exactly where you put one of those things to capture the gas is maybe not so clear. So in 2014, when we put this out, there was no continuous gas sampling in the crater. Um, I wonder if it's more diffuse. I wonder if it's evolving where it makes it out. Did events like the recent 2004 to 2008 
um, eruptions, sort of change where gas might be leaking out. But yeah, gas coming off of the magma chamber and making its way up could be a fine way to make long period earthquakes in times when there isn't an active eruption. Brandon, I'm curious with the, um, with the, the study you were doing where you're looking at the st density of the station spacing and the scattered wave imaging and the quality of the scattered wave imaging, um, I'm wondering if there's a trade-off with the duration of the deployment that you need to get the data set that you need to get those images. Um, is there some chance that, you know, as you're going down and getting, being able to use higher and higher frequency data, do you have a sense of whether at some point we'd be able to reduce the duration of the deployment or is it going the other way around that to get the sort of resolution that we want, we need to be leaving these stations out longer than we have? Do you have any? The higher frequency we're interested, we can probably push it shorter. Um, and, and people who have, say, worked on things like P multiples in the crust have found that actually fairly small earthquakes, five fives to sixes, sometimes even low fives, can be simpler to work with because they have very short source time functions. So when we're concerned with, say, one to two hertz energy, um, the, the background noise on Earth is not so strong there. So these magnitude five five-ish earthquakes are Awesome. Whereas if I want to look at transition zone discontinuities and I, and I want periods going that, that, you know, 10, 20 second period present in my receiver functions, I want some big earthquakes. Um, so, so the signal to yeah. noise, even for the teleseisms at those high frequencies is, is not a problem? A problem. I mean, you, you, you need more than one. Those images made with realistic noise levels added to them had five earthquakes from the left and five from the right. So we didn't put in the kind of on the order of 100 earthquakes that we often put in a receiver function image. We put in um, something like an order of magnitude less than that, something like you might be able to achieve in one, two, three months of recording. So, but there's a counterpoint, right, to that, that often for the higher frequency signals, we talk about the low cost type of deployments like the nodal um, nodal seismic type deployments, but to see that very, those smaller earthquakes at teleseismic distances, you, we're going to need very high quality uh, deployments. So again, the deployment becomes more challenging than using the, is that true or, or not? I don't think that's true. Um, one hertz P waves show up fine on the, on the nodal instruments. I mean, there'll be some that you'll have a cultural signal nearby them. Um, the thing that's helpful, the newer generation ones are, are a five hertz corner rather than 10. 10, you're, you know, you're an order of magnitude below the corner, so you're kind of pushing it. But we have to realize earthquakes are really big signals. Um, you know, if you're looking at a magnitude six earthquake, our signal to noise ratio is not in the single digits for those. It's huge. They're often very, very clear. So even on a short period instrument, you can have very high signal to noise. And I think there's the possibility that we're more often limited by our spatial sampling of that wave field than the quality of recording at frequencies around one hertz. That's not to say the others are not important, but you wouldn't need instruments spaced as closely if you also want, say, a background surface wave tomography image. 10, 20 kilometer spacing, you know, how often do you want to measure a, a wave that has a wavelength of tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers? I, I don't want to measure that every 300 meters. Um, so, so yeah, there's, this is not a one instrument to do everything kind of answer, but I think there are a lot of interesting questions at this high frequency end of earthquakes that, um, we could, we could explore in the future. That stuff has been less fashionable in the past 15 years. There's a couple of people down there. Yeah. Um, first off, this was a great presentation. Thanks a lot for that. And I was wondering when you do your kernel-based receiver function imaging based on the finite difference computations. Do you have a comparison of a CCP stack-based inversion with one where your kernels just have a 1D structure or a smooth 2D structure? Or maybe I missed that. Um, I don't have that right here in that format. That is exact, that is effectively what the comparison with the GRT is. <coughs> So if, if you were to do the edge on scattering with a simple 1D model, it would look just like the GAT? Yes, because the forward model, that the forward operator that's implicit in both of those is a rate theoretical operator. So if, if you could have 
You, you, the only difference here between these images really should be the improved stack coherence by accounting for the smooth velocity structure in the background. How, they, how different methods respond to noise, other subtleties could change. But if we say make a 1D image with a very simple structure that actually has a 1D background, they come out so that you can subtract the two and you see nothing but really small numbers. So. Okay. Okay, Jeff, uh, Jeff has a comment, yeah. and then we're going to have to go to coffee. Yeah, I, so there's a question. I want to explore a little bit this notion that you were advocating getting up to several hertz out of teleseismic body waves. I mean, I you, think even my, one or two would be nice. Well, one, but so, I mean, I guess the issue that I'm worrying about is not that there's not signal at these higher Absolutely. frequencies, but that scattering becomes a much bigger problem, not just sort of the simple scattering that's implicit in you know, these kinds of models, but, you know, if you look at the coda at one, two, three, four hertz, I mean, it's a mess when you start to look at those signals, unlike the kind of half hertz. And I'm wondering, you know, this sort of suggests we need to think about how to look at these signals quite differently than this sort of traditional receiver function deconvolution approach, which sort of implicitly assumes that there's a linear operator between, say, a vertical and a horizontal component or something like that. And have you thought about what else is needed in order to get sort of coherent things at those frequent out of signals at those frequencies? Just just the data. Um, I, yeah, I don't think it, it changes in that the imaging methods would break down. When we see dense arrays that have been deployed, um, there was an experiment through University of Arizona where in uh, a Green River Basin they had put out broadbands, sort of excessive instrumentation, but spaced every few hundred meters. Um, and then people had eventually looked at things like travel times and receiver functions, and you could push them up to five hertz easily, sometimes 10 hertz for events, and the structure they recovered looked like the known structure of the Green River Basin. Um, we have an experiment with seven kilometer broadband spacing in the Central Valley in Central California, and um, those receiver functions and individual stations look terrible. They're very energetic. You wouldn't really know how to interpret them, but you put them next to each other at seven kilometer spacing, and all of a sudden they look a lot like what we know from industry about the geometry of that basin. Um, so I, I think the, you know, one of the benefits in seismology is that the physics is really old and simple. It's um, computational power sometimes to do the forward problem right. It's data to be able to see the features we want to see. But I don't think it breaks down just because we go from a half a hertz to two and a half. I think we just get five times the resolution. Okay, that um, Paul's insisting on a question. Sorry, one last question. I was just curious if you or other people working on the IMUSH project have any ideas about why magma transport does what it does to get focused out toward Mount St. Helens. You know, the volcano's in a really unusual place. It's much closer to the trench than the other Cascade volcanoes. It's been the most active Cascade volcano for the last 5,000 years, and for tens of thousands of years, there must have been a pretty high magma flux to create that focus of activity. So I'm just curious if there are structural or other features that might uh, focus magma in that direction. And the problem gets even more uh, kind of curious when you look at some of the regional mafic uh, volcanism that comes up in monogenetic cones back by Indian Heaven or uh, other areas around St. Helens, because geochemically they show very reduced uh, indications of fluid mobile elements that might be recycled from the slab into the mantle compared to other parts of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. So if anything, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing less indication of a um, of a strongly hydrated four arc wedge or or uh, regions behind it. So anyway, I'm just curious if anybody has any thoughts about that. Those are definitely where the groups, um, many of the groups' discussions are focused lately. Um, I think we can say really clearly from what Jeff Jeff Aber's group is working on that there's a slab there, at least averaged over, you know single digit to tens of kilometer length scales. There's right, a slab there. Because people have suggested um, from the geochemistry that in the past that perhaps there was a tear or something allowing sub-slab material. There is not a large in. tear. Um, this gets more to the end of things that we can't really model accurately, but geology does weird stuff and it doesn't always um, fit the scales of our models. I, I don't know that I'd rule out that little volumes of basaltic melt can't actually come up through it. Um, that would be strange. They'd have to go through something cold. Um, maybe it's actually just more of a 3D convection aspect. When people do run convection experiments in 3D, they see that there's a time-dependent nature to it. Sometimes the low velocities will sort of make these little 
fingers farther up into the wedge in some part of the subduction zone, you know, farther than they do in others. And maybe we're seeing that hot material from the wedge propagate a little farther in toward Mount St. Helens right now. I don't know why. Um, so it's definitely something we're looking at. I think the one thing that we can rule out is the wholesale slab tear beneath St. Helens. But yeah, it's for arc location is, is odd. It's about, if it were about 50 kilometers east, we wouldn't really talk about it. But, um, but it's, it's strangely far to the west where we expect things might be pretty cold at depth. Okay, well, we're going to have to cut this off. This is great. We had a nice discussion. And uh, let's go to coffee and then uh, be back here at 11.